Welcome again, everyone that's watching us here or online to our special series of Easter services starting today. And even though it's Palm Sunday, what I want to do today is concentrate on not just Palm Sunday, but particularly those events that happened at the end of that week. Our theme for Easter is this changes everything. Easter changes so much about how we live our life and how our relationship with God is. So even though today is Palm Sunday, I want to focus on the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. First, I want to tell the story. I don't know if uh, too many people would know, but I'd hazard a guess. Most people have not heard of a guy called Stanislav Petrov. Now, there was a Petrov in Australian history. There was a husband and wife that uh, Soviet spies that defected to Australia. But this Stanislav Petrov, was a lieutenant in the Soviet air defences. And his story happens in the 1983. Tensions were high in the world. The Soviet military had shot down Korean Airlines Flight 007 and tensions were high. Petrov was the duty officer at the command centre for the nuclear early warning system that the Soviets had. And observers were worried that one day a nuclear war would break out, that someone would hit the button too early. And Stanislav was on duty one day and he observed that there was a airstrike, nuclear missiles coming from America to Russia. First just one. Then there was another two or three that followed after that. But he looked at all the the data and he wondered why initially only one and then another couple. He judged that the reports were a false alarm. And that was a risky thing to, to judge because the protocol was that he wasn't the one to push the button, but if he saw something happening, he was responsible for telling the Soviet authorities and they would launch a retaliatory strike. If he was right he would have saved the world. If he was wrong, he might have condemned his country to a nuclear oblivion. Now, obviously, it's 2024. You haven't missed a nuclear war in our lifetime. So what he judged was right. But he had the courage of his convictions not to report it and literally is credited sometimes for saving the world. And yet, as I said, I'd hazard a guess that we almost, most of us would not know his name or know the significance of what he did. Today, as we look at the Easter story, I want to say that the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus nearly suffered the same fate. I want to look at the courage of two people. You may or may not know their names, but I would hazard a guess we don't always realise the significance of the courage of the decision that they took. You may not know their names, but I don't think they get the credit that they deserve for what they did to save Easter themselves. When Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, he says this, I passed on to you what was most important and what has also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. So for Paul, as he's writing to the Corinthians, he says nothing is more important than that. There's other things that we can look at, there's good things, there's wise things, there's things that we can disagree on, but nothing is more important than the fact Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he raised on the third day. But it nearly didn't happen. It nearly didn't happen that way. And we know, we accept that God would have had everything under his control, but humanly speaking, if it hadn't been for the intervention of these two guys, what we know of, what we see, what we see recorded in the Scriptures, almost didn't happen. So I want to look at these two guys. We know them as Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Let's call them Nick and Joe. 
and see how they changed everything for us. Nick and Joe belong to a group called the Pharisees, and the Pharisees often, rightly, get a really bad name in terms of their relationship with Jesus. They were the religious leaders, the best of the best, and they took it upon themselves to uphold God's standard. Their full-time job was being good. And they didn't like Jesus, and often Jesus didn't like them for the way that they were acting. Because Jesus wouldn't follow their rules. And people liked Jesus more than they liked the Pharisees. Because people were sick and tired of being judged for the way they didn't live up to the rules. And Jesus seemed to accept them and be loving. But it was a tiny breakaway group of Pharisees. And if you're at Westside a couple of weeks ago, we looked at this group who, again, were causing the church early trouble. But they had transferred over from the group of Pharisees and they were now Christians. They embraced Jesus. And there was a small group who who saw something in Jesus, as much as they didn't always like or understand what he was on about, they were prepared to listen and learn because he had the popularity and he had this sense of being from God. So the first guy in this group we'll look at is Nicodemus. And we don't know how it happened, whether he was really keen himself or he drew drew the short straw. And this group said, go and see Jesus. And and so he went at night. Obviously at night it's a lot darker back then than it is now. So it was a way to keep your identity secret because they couldn't be seen to be associating with Jesus. They were against him. But they decided that Nicodemus was going to be the one to represent them and go to Jesus and ask all these questions. And so Nicodemus comes at night and he's saying, look, you know, I, I know there's something different about you. You know, we, we think God has called you somehow. No one could do the miracles that you've done, you know, if it weren't for some sort of divine intervention. And there's a whole conversation that goes in John 3, but I'm going to pick it up from verse 13. Jesus said, no one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man, that's what he called himself, has come down from heaven. So as I said, Jesus had a whole lot of stuff before this, but this is really confronting to Nicodemus. It's almost blasphemous. It's okay to feel someone has been called by God to do something, but actually say, you've come from heaven? I mean, that's, that's really blasphemous, really border on claiming something for himself that is just ludicrous. And then verse 14. Jesus said, and as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness. So Jesus is talking about this incident that happened as the Israelites are wandering around as they've come out of Egypt. And they camped at this place and there was a whole lot of snakes. I can't think of anything worse myself, but there was a whole lot of snakes. And and God said, this is what to do. Make a bronze snake. Put it up on a pole, lift it up, plant it in the ground. And those who look at that, they'll be protected from these snakes. So he goes on. So just as the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness is lifted up, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Now, this this, is not just the, the bronze serpent Thing, I think this other thing would have really confronted Nicodemus. Now, they call it the law. Sometimes we call it good works. But Nicodemus was on about, as the Pharisees were, about behaving. You behave your way into the kingdom. You do the right thing. You obey the law. You, and, 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 and they went just overboard because they got Ten Commandments, and to make it easier, they broke it down into 613 different ones you could look at and have to obey. And Nicodemus says, surely it's, it's everyone who behaves, not everyone who believes. And no, Jesus said, no, it's everyone who believes. It's an eternal thing, internal thing. It's a spiritual birth, being born again, he talked about earlier. And then verse 16, well, this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him 
would not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Now, we'll leave Nicodemus there, but I think it would have really churned up his whole world view thinking of this. That Jesus is claiming to have come out of heaven, that now people get into the kingdom by believing and not behaving, and something about a bronze snake being lifted up. I mean, this is just too much for him to take. Nicodemus does appear again in the Gospels, but for the sake of time, we'll skip over that. But it just showed he was at least willing, even if it was secretive, to engage with Jesus and to ask questions. And Jesus was prepared to engage back and really challenge his worldview. The other guy in our story, the brave Nicodemus, is Joseph. And all four Gospels speak about Joseph in one way or another. Matthew says, as evening approached, Joseph, a rich man from Arimathea, who had become a follower of Jesus. Mark says that Joseph was an honoured member of the council, the high council, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. Luke says that Joseph had not agreed with the decision and actions of the other religious leaders. He was from the town of Arimathea in Judea and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. And John records that Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus because he feared the Jewish leader. And all this time, by this time, Jesus had been arrested. And he was being crucified. And I wonder in my mind's eye, there was a big crowd there. That's what happened at crucifixion. And in my mind's eye, maybe because they were so steeped in the Old Testament, they must have been very much aware of Isaiah 53 and how much related to this. He was despised and rejected a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him, looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. We thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We've left God's paths to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. And I'm wondering if looking at that event, as Jesus was lifted up on that cross, that Nicodemus, it finally twigged. Maybe that's what he was talking about, this bronze snake being lifted up. Maybe that's what it was about. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was like a lamb to the slaughter and a sheep before his shearers is silent, didn't open his mouth, unjustly condemned. He was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants. His life was cut short midstream. He was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and never deceived anyone. He was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. Just remember that part. We'll come to that in a second. And seeing this, Jesus died. So the first part of what Paul said had come true. Jesus had died, and it was for our sin. But the next part of what Paul said, that he was buried, that part nearly didn't happen. Let me explain. In those days, they had a really unfortunate term for the people who were crucified. And it was basically dog food. 
or bird food. They said the crucified person was a meal for birds of prey and grim scraps for dogs. Suetonius, a writer in the Times, said, for the person who's crucified, the carrion birds will quickly take care of his burial. I know it's gross and horrible to think, but if you've ever watched one of those David Attenborough documentaries where the vultures come down on a carcass and they're able to devour it in just a few minutes. And with the wild dogs and those sort of birds around, that's what happened to most of the people who were crucified. And a guy called John Dominic Crosser, now he's a fairly liberal Christian, he doesn't believe a lot of the miracles and stuff about Jesus, but really good on history, and he says this. Roman crucifixion was state terrorism. Its function was to deter resistance or revolt, particularly among the lower classes. And the body was usually left on the cross to be consumed eventually by the wild beasts. No wonder we have found only one body from all those thousands crucified around Jerusalem in that single century. And it's interesting, they found a foot bone with a big nail through it where the two feet are nailed together. And as I said, it's it's gross to think about. But for most people, the body was left to rot. It would either be attacked on the cross or it would drop off. People would leave and the birds and the dogs would attack. For the Romans, part of the shame of crucifixion was not just the punishment, not just the torture, not just the death, but when the person died, they would not be buried. They were denied burial rites as a last act of humiliation. A couple of weeks ago, Bonnie and I watched a documentary she found online. And it was called Finding Michael. And I won't spoil it all and tell you the ending or anything like that, but in it, the young guy that's pictured there, the youngest guy there, Spencer Matthews, goes looking for the body of his brother, Michael, who died on Mount Everest when he was attempting the summit in 19... 19- 99. And this is current, this is this year or it was filmed last year. That's about 20 years since his brother had died. And I don't know if you're aware of it, but since Sir Edmund Hillary, the big New Zealander, and his Sherpa, Tenzing Norgay, were the first to set foot on Mount Everest in 1953, hundreds, if not thousands of people have attempted that climb to Mount Everest. And I read that they've accepted another 400 or so to climb this year. The trouble is 300 people have died trying, either getting up to the summit or it's just as dangerous to get back. And so in this documentary, Spencer Matthews heads to Everest to try to to find his brother Michael, who disappeared 23 years ago And on the way, they find all sorts of litter, uh, abandoned campsites, tents, oxygen bottles, all sorts of things there. And as I said, I won't spoil it, but along the way, in looking for his brother's body, they find heaps of other bodies, these 300 that have been left there. And they meet up with another Sherpa, a family of Sherpas who have died there And they're able to find one of these bodies on Everest and and bring him down and get closure for the family. And I found it really fascinating that, you know, we've made whole businesses out of death. That's because every culture, every civilization has something about, you know, not just allowing the body of someone to lay where they pass but we have respect to want to lay a person, to to lay them to rest, to prepare a place for them, to have some respect in not just that they stay where they died, but have 
some sort of thing. And the cruelty of the Romans, the shame of the crucifixion, was that most of the time the bodies were not buried. They were left there in the flesh, just in the stomachs of dogs and birds everywhere. So how can Paul say, if Jesus would have faced that, he was buried? Because in John's Gospel it says, Afterwards, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus because he feared the Jewish leaders, asked Pilate for permission to take down Jesus' body. And when Pilate gave permission, Joseph came and took the body away. And with him came Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night. And he bought about 75 pounds of perfumed ointment made from myrrh and aloe. And I say again, humanly speaking, I know God had it in control, but humanly speaking, if it hadn't been for these two guys, there's no way Paul could have said and that he was buried. If it hadn't been the intervention of these guys for, for Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, quite respected leaders, to have the courage to go up to the governor of the day and say, I don't want Jesus treated like this, like everyone else. I want his body so that we can lay it to rest with respect. Of course, the burial wasn't a hole in the ground like we have most of the time today. It was a tomb and not just any tomb. Because we read in Matthew, Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a long, clean sheet of clean linen cloth. And he placed it in his own tomb. Do you get that? It was his own tomb, which had been carved out of the rock. And he rolled a great stone across the entrance and left. And again, humanly speaking, if it hadn't been for the intervention of Joseph and Nicodemus, if Joseph hadn't offered his own place. Imagine that, reading that scripture in in Isaiah 53 and saying he was placed in a rich man's tomb and thinking, I'm the fulfilment of that prophecy. It's me. They may not have fully embraced who Jesus was and outwardly and openly followed Jesus. It says a number of times there that they were secret disciples. Now they were going to sure be out in the open when he died. I mean, taking down the body, approaching Pilate in front of the the crowds there, seeing that very publicly was really putting their faith on the line. And it was their faith, it was their courage that paved the way for that first group of Christians to have that message when Jesus was raised from the dead to be able to realise that Jesus died that he was buried. So it's really a sermon today about three words. He was buried. And that's how Nick and Joe saved Easter. That's how it changed everything. I want you to notice these two things that are that are going on. Joseph, who gave up his tomb, He offered his place where he would be one day. But instead, he offered his place to Jesus. And it paved the way for this understanding that we have of Easter and the Christian faith to see the meaning of what happened on the cross is that we allow Jesus to take our place. He took the punishment that should have been ours. He took the suffering that should have been ours as Isaiah talked about. We thought, you know, they thought, oh, he's getting punished by God, but God was putting the punishment that we deserved on him. He took the punishment that should have been ours. He died the death we should have died. And literally, Joseph said, I want Jesus to take my place 
in the tomb. That divine exchange that took place in that way. And that's the core meaning of the gospel. The core meaning of what happened to Jesus on the cross. He took our place. And for Joseph it literally was. He took his place in his tomb. And for everyone else, it's through faith. Second thing that was going on is this. Crucifixion caused the others to run. Often the, the, the apostles were at Jesus' side when he was doing miracles. It was, I think they were lapping up the attention. When they were feeding the 5,000, they were the ones collecting the baskets. When people were too close, they'd go, go away, little children, Jesus doesn't have time for you. They're arguing about who's the most important. Who's going to sit next to Jesus in his coming kingdom? But when it got tough, people like Peter that denied he ever knew him and just ran away into the shadows. Genuine believers, when things got tough, just went away. But the crucifixion brought Nicodemus and Joseph out of the woodwork. I said we might not have been full-on public followers of Jesus when he was alive, but we're sure as heck going to be public ones now that he's dead. We might not have fully understood or appreciated or, or came to terms with all that Jesus was about publicly when he was in this ministry, but now I don't care who sees us go to Pilate. I don't care who sees us take the body. We're going to stand up and follow no matter what. And what they did, the courage of that conviction made it possible for this idea that the first century, the first generation of Christians understood that you enter the kingdom of God, not just how you behave, but through whom you believe. It's been up on the screen. We enter a relationship with God not through how we behave, but through whom we believe that it's time at this time, as we think about Easter and the importance of that, not to shrink back, not to take a backward step, but to fully embrace what Jesus went through for us. And just like Joseph did, we understand at the core of what we saw on the cross is Jesus taking our place. For Joseph, it was literally taking his place in his own tomb. And as Isaiah said, it's taking our punishment to be on him. Maybe you're like Nicodemus and Joseph, exploring who Jesus is, but not being prepared to take that full step to follow. To have a, a real act of courage to say, no, I'll embrace this fully. I give respect to Jesus. So let's fully appreciate what Jesus went through for us. This changes everything. And as the events of that, those days and weeks unfolded, it just made such a difference to people in the world. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the courage of people like Joseph and Nicodemus, who in a very public way, in a very courageous way, are prepared to stand out and how we understand now that Jesus is taking our place like for Joseph, that he literally took his place in his own tomb. So Lord, whatever we do over Easter, there's people going away, there's people having holidays, people struggling with sickness. But Lord, whatever we do, may we not lose sight of the fact of the centrality of that message, how important it is that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried and that he rose again. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for taking our place on the cross and in that tomb so that when Sunday comes and new life bursts forth, we can enjoy that too. In Jesus' name. Thank you.